All right, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Chris's Corner where today we are going to be discussing some very important topics when it comes to OCD treatment, resistance with OCD treatment and how to encourage people to stick with treatment, be consistent and motivated. And I am so lucky today to have two of the greatest uh, people I look up to in the treatment world of OCD who I personally feel are the experts in this area and they're gonna be able to share their knowledge with you. So whether you are a treatment provider wanting to learn some more information, a family or a loved one of someone with OCD or an individual with OCD yourself, you are at the right place. So before I introduce my guest, just a quick little announcement. I want to remind you guys that this live stream, it's intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. So for treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a hotline for crisis events and should not be used if you are in distress or feeling unsafe. If you are in a crisis or you are ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911 or call the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. Also, we wanna let you know, we are trying to create the safest space as possible here at the IOCDF's official social media, why we do Chris's Corner. So please be kind and respect everyone. With that, this is being recorded on various social me media platforms. And please be mindful that if you ask personal questions or leave comments that this is gonna be recorded. At the end of the day, we are all here to support one another. All right, so I am extremely excited to jump in and introduce my two guests. So. I will introduce the first gentleman I have on the show. I mean, gentleman is a little bit, you know, pushing it, but still um, got to be respectful. So the first guest is Dr. Pollard. He is the founder and director of the Center for OCD and Anxiety Related Disorders at St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute. And he is Professor Emeritus, you're going to have to help me with that word, of Family and Community Medicine at St. Louis University. He is on the Scientific and Clinical Advisory Board of the International OCD Foundation and chairs the organization's training committee, including an international initiative called the Behavioral Therapy Training Institute. Dr. Pollard has a special clinical interest in patients who have difficulty engaging in treatment and is currently working on a book to help the families of OCD treatment refusers. Hello, Alec. Welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, so our second guest is Jonathan Grayson. He is a licensed psychologist and director of the Grayson Center, an adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and the behavioral sciences at the University of Southern California. This is where he lectures and supervises residents. Dr. Grayson has been specializing in the treatment of OCD for more than 40 years and is na a national recognized expert he also authored Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, a personalized recovery program for living with uncertainty, which is a self-help guide for sufferers. In 2010, the IOCDF awarded Dr. Grayson the Patty Perkins Lifetime Achievement Award for his devotion and contributions to the treatment of those with OCD. In October of 2010, the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies gave his book, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, the Self-Help Book of Merit Award recognizing his book as providing sufferers with the highest level of information about the practices and treatments for OCD. Dr. Grayson has presented workshops and written numerous articles and book chapters for both professionals and lay audiences, including two manual videotape sets made for the IOCDF. One is the Goal Handbook, Running a Successful Support Group for OCD and How to Recognize and Respond to OCD in School-Aged Children. His work and expertise has been featured in national media, including People Magazine, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Nightline. He serves on both the Scientific Advisory Board and the Speakers Bureau of the IOCDF. In 1981, along with Gail Frankel, he started the first support group in the country for OCD. He helped to form and donate his time to a free goal support group in LA in 2015. Finally, he has the distinction of being the first and possibly the only professional to run a yearly OCD camping trip. So as you can tell, both of my guests today are absolute experts in the field and are definitely, definitely prepared to help you all understand resistance and OCD treatment and how to stay motivated. So welcome gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Our pleasure, I think sure. Absolutely. So the first question I want to ask, and maybe you can both tackle it. The biggest question a lot of family members and loved ones have watching this is, 
yes, ERP, great treatment for OCD. We get it, we get it. But my loved one is just refusing to get into treatment. Where would be a good place for parents or loved ones watching this to start to maybe help with that resistance to OCD treatment? You are asking the magic question. No, I know. I mean, whenever a family member asks this at a conference, I wish I had the simple answer. I mean, I think there's, it, it kind of separates into two answers. And I'm going to let Alec start with the second one. But I'll, I'll, you know, the first one really starts with a lot of therapists because I think a lot of therapists fail to understand what they're asking the client. You know, because when we're asking them to do this treatment, it feels like an incredible risk and therapists don't really go through much like why would you take this risk you know it's just like well it makes sense to and you know so i like to ask therapists imagine i have a gun with a thousand chambers one chamber has a bullet and the other has the other 999 have 50 million dollars will you aim this gun at your child do they say no suppose we make it 10,000 chambers right 9,999 chances to win 50 mil. Will you aim it at the child though? We'll make it 100,000. Let's face it, one in 100,000 chance of killing your kid, you probably take that risk driving in a car. And yet, most people still are not going to point their gun at their kid. You have to find a reason for the sufferer to take that risk. You know, so you have to be really serious as a therapist. So I think one, one major area is, is the therapist really thinking about what they're really asking the client. It's still not an easy question, which is why I'm dumping the hard part on Alec of what you tell families. Before you answer Alec, I mean, that's a really good point, doctor. Uh, good point, John. I mean, that's absolutely a really good point you just made. I think sometimes um, a lot of feedback that people in our community with OCD will say is that sometimes the therapists don't address that. And it's just this idea, like, just do it. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, Alec, how about the second part to that question? Well, it, as I understood the rules of today, you're supposed to answer the actual question, John. Not, <laughs> not come on, and then let me answer it. That's, that's terrible. Well, I always look up to you. <laughs> I'm actually below you, though, on this thing. Yeah, but uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. So, um, uh, okay, so I mean, actually, what you were saying, John, about like there's two answers. Um, uh, I kind of was thinking in that same direction, although maybe I don't know if we have the same answers to this, but but I mean, there's just the obvious things of providing information uh, that uh, that usually um, is the first step. Right. Like because um, the person may not know they have OCD. Uh, OK, so you provide information about OCD. Um, you may even provide information on treatment and resources and um, pamphlets, whatever, websites, whatever you think they might look into. And then you see um, their receptivity. And now many of the families I end up talking to are way past that point. But I just let's start at the beginning. That's the useful thing to do. Um, once that's done and then you, again, I assume we're talking about people who are resistant so that if they say, oh, yeah, that's I, I'll let's go get treatment. Uh, that's probably not the people that we're talking about today, <laughs> we're talking about folks who have some level of resistance. So um, once that's done, the natural response then is for the family to tell them why they should go. Um, and that is not necessarily if you're going to do that. Do it once. That's it. Um, but twice, now we're getting into a pattern where you may be doing more harm than good. But but you don't want to dwell on that too long because what's important is why not why you think they ought to go, but why the individual thinks he or she needs to go. And um, <clears throat> so... Uh, I would recommend rather than you pointing out all the ways that they're dysfunctional, for example, um, that if you have a relationship with this person where you can actually sit and talk about, ask them how they're doing, how they see things in their life, um, what do they want for themselves in the future? 
What are their aspirations? And do they see any obstacles in the way where you're really kind of doing what we as therapists would call motivational interviewing? Um, uh, but you're focusing on trying to help them recognize as opposed to you telling them why they're dysfunctional. Uh, again, I, I'm all for you telling them one time your opinion about things, but uh, but don't do it more than once because you'll set up a dynamic that 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 maybe some folks are in now, but but won't be helpful. So so those are the first steps um, that provide information, and then uh, a heart to heart about how asking them about how they see their lives, what their aspirations are, to see if they can't start to question whether or not they would be open to trying something different. Thank you for that. And, and Dr. Or John, one question for you is, is, is it okay for parents or loved ones to put a little bit of pressure? That's a question that was asked. Is it okay for them to put a little bit of pressure if they've been, let's say they have been kind of backing off, talking to their loved one about going to treatment and then, you know, maybe the loved one isn't really making any movement. Is it okay to put a little pressure or is it better for the family to just back off indefinitely until that person comes back around? I know situations are different, but in general, maybe. So I think, I think the answer to both those options would be no. Uh, obviously backing off if a person's really resistant and they're growing down the tubes, they're just doing that more. But uh, the idea of putting pressure on uh, and, and I do have an entire treatment where we're doing stuff like that, but it has to be done really carefully. Uh, if they're just going to put pressure on, they're just going to be, you know, and they don't know, they don't know what they're doing. You're just going to have a series of really fights that are going to deteriorate and get nowhere. So, um, you know, uh, the family trying to figure out how to put pressure on isn't going to work. You know, it's like telling a family, to use tough love, you know, it sounds kind of nice in theory, but most people aren't going to do that. They're not going to throw the kid out in the street, nor do I think they should. Um, you know, we're talking about a system that's really complex where there's probably a lot of accommodation and you can't just take that apart all at once. If you do, you're going to have World War III and get nowhere. So um, the in-between it is no. Okay, so both of the extremes, it sounds like, doesn't work. Yeah, and Alec was shaking his head yes, so I feel like I was doing good. <laughs> you got the right answer. That was good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I look for this approval. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there is a point at which um, the, then the fan, uh, and, and I should say this is, it's sort of like, okay, do these other things that we talked about, then see how things go. Um then there's a point at which down the road, the family has to then, as long as they've given it time to see how the individual is going to respond, they then need to switch gears and start thinking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, but that's not, I'm going to strategically see how I can nag this person to go to therapy. This is like, I'm, so they may start withdrawing accommodations, but on a pattern of how they can free themselves up from the influence of the OCD, which is a different thing than trying to nag the person into treatment. Um, I have realized, I'm saying I'm as the family member, that I am burdened by this terribly. And I have my right to have well being. This is the person with OCD is not the only person the family has a right to a life. So I need to start looking at how I'm going to make myself better, which means often extricating um, themselves from the influence of the OCD, but at a pace they can handle and because they are trying to reclaim their lives, not because they're trying to nag the person with OCD into the um, <clears throat> into getting better. So now, those, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, so in those circumstances um, where, you know, if I'm at all involved with it and we're determining this individual is not going to do treatment. Um, I'm not going to throw them out and say like, Hey, they're not ready for treatment. So good luck. At that point, I do stop seeing the identified patient and the patient now becomes the family. 
how am I going to help them change the situation? And, and what is the system we're going to do that? Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, and, and that is one of those dilemmas because I know we have a lot of therapists listening. I believe we do, right? Yeah, correct. So this is something that, that very important to formally negotiate. Um, who's my patient? Um, and um, if I think there's, if I, if I'm actually seeing the person with OCD, I might, uh, now we have the luxury of this because we have a large staff, but I might suggest the family go to see another therapist in case the patient, the original patient decided to change his mind and come into treatment. I'm still there. Um, uh, and I haven't been contaminated, pardon the expression, <laughs> by, um, by, by advising the family to do these evil things. <laughs> and, I, and I used to do that when I had access to, you know, other people to know. Uh, and I find I can end up doing both roles. And the pattern would be initially, as I'm working with the family, the patient hates my guts because I'm, well, you might agree, you know, I'm evil Grayson. Um, well, that would be a realistic assessment. Too. Yeah, yeah. But at some point, they lose their mind and they actually start to like me. Um, but, but that's a long court. But, you know, but, but you know, there, there is that transition uh, where, where, yes, you know, I get to be in both roles. And uh, so, so it's doable. I initially would have thought it wasn't possible uh, yeah. to do. But, but so I've, I've come to learn that it is possible and i think i think the other i think I, I kind of love the idea of having you know an essentially good cop bad cop i always get to be the bad cop <laughs> but um that is more expensive a lot of times and so you know that and the availability of another therapist so at least it's possible to do either way as opposed yeah. to you know i'll do it this way or don't do it yeah it is possible i mean you know I, that's why i qualified it with um, you know, I have a whole staff of people. I have the luxury of preferring to do that. If I'm an individual practitioner in a small town in Southern Missouri, I don't have the luxury <laughs> of having another person who happens to know <laughs> OCD and family intervention. And <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you because I think it's an important point to make. Sometimes clinicians will work with a client and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and it doesn't work. So taking a step back, like both of you are saying, and really start to work with a family. And, you know, it, it reminds me of that age old analogy of when you're on the plane, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. If the family's not taking care of themselves and the whole family is just centered around trying to get this person to get treatment, they're not taking care of themselves and aren't much use in this situation. I wanted to jump into a question from Rob. It's from Robin Graham. It'll pop up on the screen in a second at 909. Uh, the specific question is, you know, what do we do with a team that says, oh, I have to do this forever. But to maybe centralize the question a little bit more, that's one of the things sometimes people will say really hurts their motivation is they hear that OCD is a chronic disorder and they think that they have to do this forever. So if that's something that, uh, you know, a client of yours brings up in session, how do you guys address that issue so that they don't, that, that's not something that basically deflates their motivation for treatment? I have a list that uh, was written by a former patient that I slightly modified that's called the 13 excuses reasons why I'm gonna like not do you know why I'm giving it or not doing treatment you know like like you know oh I had a particularly hard day you know or this is too difficult and um Chris is frozen I wonder if this means the entire thing oh no 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 is. I'm I'm reading there's so many questions by the way Dr McGrath says hi he's watching so <laughs> okay. but um <laughs> And so one of them is, oh, I'm going to have to do this forever. Now, overlooking the obvious answer of like the alternative to doing it forever is suffering. But the other answer is, as somebody recovers, I mean, it is true. You do have to learn to accept slips will happen. But a slip happening doesn't mean I'm going back to the hell that I was in. And, you know, one reaches a point of recovery where there are lots of times you're not thinking about it. You know, so, yeah, there is that disappointing thing that a slip will happen. And the thing that's nasty about the slip is it always feels like you're back where you started. But the person, you know, but but so I'd like to warn people. So when they're there, it's like, oh, yeah, they told me it would be this bad. Maybe I'm not really lost. So I think the freedom 
you know, I, th I think somebody saying that they're they're really looking at like I have to do it forever. It's going to be like right now in treatment. Um, I mean, it's one of the things why Alex's work in helping to educate people is so critical because a lot of people have had bad bad you know ERP or no ERP, which is worse. So having repeated, you know, it's one thing to fail legitimately. It's really sad, as we so often see, people failing in treatment because the therapist was not doing treatment really in a good way, leaving the person to conclude and feel hopeless. You know, so I mean, it's kind of great if somebody talks to me, if it turns out that something I'm suggesting we're to do in treatment they haven't had before. You know, because it's one thing, oh, I might be supposed to be really good at it, but if I'm saying the same stuff, it's not too encouraging. So, you know, I think really pointing out to the team, well, you know, doing it forever is not like suffering like you are now. Doing it forever is not, you know, so it's, yes, it's like being on a diet. You may have to do it forever. It beats the alternative. And, you know, all the things you want in life, blah, 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 that you're talking about get to be possible. Uh, giving up, you know what that life will look like. You've tried that experiment. Yeah, I wouldn't add anything to that, what John said, except that um, that everything you have to do the rest of your life. There isn't anything you don't have to do the rest. You're going to have to eat the rest of your life. You're going to have to, like, struggle with diets, exercise, whatever, it is, balancing work and play. All of these issues are lifelong things, but they you have some struggles and you have some joys. But I'm mostly curious, John, whether your list is a coincidence that it's 13. <laughs> I believe that the client who made that list up did that on purpose. <laughs> so so, so yeah, yes. uh, the other option would be 666. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. She had that list too. <laughs> Alec, I'm just disappointed to find out that I have to work out forever because an infomercial I saw at two in the morning last night said I just take a few pills and I'm thin forever. So now I feel very lied to. Oh, so I'll no, have to no, address no, I that. like your thing better. I, I <laughs> want to find out about that. Yeah. yeah. I want to jump into another question by Felice Becker at 916. Therapists hear this question a lot. Um, you know, my, my loved ones in therapy, but they can't do our ERP or ERP doesn't work or they're afraid of ERP. Is there a way to present the treatment in a way that doesn't maybe scare people as much? And then the second part to that question is if you have a client that's come in and they've said to you, hey, in the past I've done ERP, it didn't work for me. How do you address that? Generally. I, I'm, and, and I guess this is good news. The vast majority of the time, it's been terrible treatment. You know, again, it may be it may, and, and in a few ways. That initial question, why would you take that risk? That wasn't explained. What's the goal of treatment? I mean, you know, I some people know I kind of think OCD has a lot to do with uncertainty and living with uncertainty. So if I'm afraid that I'm going to, you know, kill my wife tonight, so we're doing all this exposure about imagine killing her. Well, if I don't know I'm supposed to be living with uncertainty. Why is this going to make, you know, so like, okay, that's going to make me not scared of the thought, but what's going to make sure I don't kill her? You know, so the, my goal in treatment is wrong. So of course I'm going to fail in it. So I think there are a lot of ways that people do treatment improperly. So somebody, so in a sense, when I hear that, I'd like to know what it is that person Things there may you know there are definitely since everything exists to people we have who say and believe fully they can't do ERP when we've explained it as well as we can, but you know for me a lot of it has almost everything has to do with the treatment preparation uh, for that. The, the med question I tend to be really hard on as I say what if they won't take meds I, I point out this is a learned and a biological disorder. Meds alone, you know, like, and, and the meds are kind of cool because they just do what they should. They're not happy pills, even though the press makes it sound that way. We have the absolute most convincing evidence that these meds are not happy pills. They have no street value, right? Nobody's buying Prozac in the street to get happy. If they were happy pills, it'd be like, give me some of that stuff. <laughs> it was very specific job, you know. Now, it's true, meds alone won't work. You know, right? 50, you know, 25 to 50% improvement. And for some part, the learned part's so powerful, it overrides the meds. 
leading people to falsely conclude meds are useless. Um, so yeah, and, and I'm sure Alec has had this. Uh, there are plenty of times where, you know, we're seeing treatment not get really where it, it could go because the person refuses meds, you know? And so I've had people where, you know, and essentially lose seven months because they refuse, you know? So they find like, okay, maybe I'll try this. But um, I don't know, Alec? No, I think those are good points. Um, I, okay, so the first thing is, have you actually had ERP? So that's the first question. And um, this is not that hard to determine. <laughs> okay, my number one question is, I don't even get, I'm not even, I just even want to see if they did CBT, not <laughs> ERP. You know, uh, did you even get close to the letters? Did you do letters? <laughs> okay, so did you? Did your therapist give you things to do between sessions? Did you have homework? <laughs> Most of the time it's no. <laughs> so, okay, well, I don't have to ask any more questions, <laughs> right? Um, now, I, I always say, now he gave you homework, not that you didn't do it, but the, the therapist tried to have you do homework. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, they didn't do that. All right, well then we know they didn't have ERP. Then we can explain and go in that direction. If it's homework, then I want to know what the homework was. If it sounds anything close to ERP, you know, well, he gave me a rubber band. He told me, <laughs> he told me <laughs> every time I get that bad thought to snap it. And, that doesn't uh, work? No. Oh. A lot of you, and some of you may have heard me uh, critique thought stopping before, but um, there's lots of reasons why it doesn't work, but the main thing is the rubber band should be on your head. That's where your thoughts are. Come on. <laughs> that makes no sense at all. All right. There's no rubber bands big enough for my head, though. I have a fat head, so I guess I'll just have to give up on that tool. Yeah, yeah no, no. You're going to have to eliminate that. And, and there's the irrelevant fact that, and this is a little scary, in 1981, we already knew thought stopping didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh my God, they're doing the rubber band. Uh, no, they're, they're, they're that's almost older than me. <laughs> people are still doing it. If if you get nothing else, those of you in the audience, if you get nothing else from this talk, do not do thought stopping. If you don't know why, please go get training. Um, because if it's not obvious to why you do thought stopping, then you probably need to learn more about OCD. Um, and that's not the topic of our talk today. Um, the, now, the next thing is, Okay, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, they had them touch a doorknob or, you know, whatever. Uh, put a bad word in their mind and keep it there without getting rid of it. Okay, sounds like they were in the right track. All right, then the next question is about, all right, um, what I'm going to be asking about is whether they actually uh, engaged. Uh, there, there, there are two possibilities here, at least. One is... The therapist rushed into ERP too quickly. And I think, John, you were alluding to the prep Always. that, um, you know, is, has been, if I've changed over the years, if anything, it's to appreciate readiness and preparation for ERP. Um, most of the problems, not most, but a lot of them are therapists rushing too quickly into ERP before the, their, the patient is ready. So I'm looking for that. And then I'm also looking for um, uh, that wh whether the patient engaged in treatment. Those are not necessarily separate issues. They may not have engaged because they were rushed too quickly, but there are other reasons why patients don't engage in treatment and engage in what we call TIBS, treatment referring. So I want to see, um, so did you get the right product? Uh, did you get it, was the timing and application of the product sensitive? And were you ready? And then also, did you engage? If I get yeses to all those things, I'm actually in a bit of a quandary at that point about why they haven't responded. Um, but it's very rare I get yeses to all those questions. Um, so then uh, we figure out, all right. So so my response is to them when they say I've tried ERP and it doesn't work. Well, I promise you this. I will not try to do ERP with you unless I can explain to you why it hasn't worked. Either you haven't had it, <laughs> or you had it too soon, or there were some other obstacles that weren't addressed in your therapy that kept you from receiving it. And 
if I can't figure that out, you shouldn't do ERP. Why would you? Along those lines, I mean, two things. One, I mean, one thing that is amazing about ERP is that there's a really good proportion of people who respond positively to crappily done ERP. You know, so that that's kind of a nice plus. And to follow up and just say what Alex said in a different way, I will always tell a client, I do not want you to do anything that I tell you to do unless I have convinced you. I'd rather have you argue with me than just be a good little soldier because that's not going to work. Yeah, hmm. agreed. Great point. Yeah. Uh, kind of a follow up at, at 917 Chelsea, we got a question from Brooke H. Um, it's a long question, so we'll just kind of maybe take that first line. Let's say somebody does agree to work and in treatment is doing ERP. How do they stay motivated during the process? Um, so, you know, obviously we talked about motivational interviewing to get them in, but let's say they're doing the actual ERP. How does one stay motivated to keep facing the harder challenges, to keep pushing through the anxiety and to be consistent so they can get to a point that they really understand and can manage the disorder? I think as therapists, we always hope that we're good for something. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of that kind of falls on us. I mean, I do think there's a balance in treatment. I don't want to move like incredibly fast. You know, I have to be sensitive to the client, but I can move too slow. You know, if I have to lose a hundred pounds and you're telling me I'm going to lose a tenth of a pound a week, I'm running out of motivation before I get anywhere. You know, we can get it to a place where I lose like 40 pounds. I'm going to be motivated to stay. So there's that balance that I'm, I'm trying to walk. And um, I, I think, we have a lot of there are a lot of tools we have to help a patient keep in touch with why they're doing this you know what what are they losing and because you know we're, we're not only trying to have them do the exposure and response prevention we're doing a lot of cognitive stuff we're trying to get them to change their world view mm -hmm. and to live a different way and so that's equally critical. So how, what am I doing that's trying to get them to continually buy into it, to come to the conclusion on their own? They're like, I don't really have a choice. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I think I think in general, we always have three reasons to do therapy. You know, look how terrible life is. Your rituals don't actually work in the sense that everything you fear can probably happen, whether you're doing the ritual or not anyway. And the third is like, yeah, if you don't change, this is the way life's going to be forever. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, we can elaborate on those and make it, you know, more personal to the person so that they always know what they can, you know, what they can do. And I, again, so many people feel helpless, like they cannot do it. And, you know, it's equally important that we have convincing way to explain to that individual why they're wrong. Um, because that can be a really, you know, that's a really powerful belief. And I think luckily, I, you know, I met some people who don't do treatment, but I don't think I've met anybody who actually can. Mm. Well said. Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a good way to say it. Uh, um, I, uh, if somebody is staying motivated, in other words, if they are showing week after week that they do their homework, they you know, not, you know, the normal ups and downs that happens, but, but pretty much they're staying on track. I don't mess with them. I just try to stay out of their way because they're whatever they're doing is keeping it going. But for folks who are struggling with that, um, there are a couple of different options. And I, I thought, Chris, you sort of said this nicely, that, that, that motivation interviewing is for that initial like, OK, I have a reason to do this. I want to go to college. I yeah. I want to have a relationship. I want a career, whatever it is. Um, but 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 the thing that really influences behavior is immediate consequences more than. I mean, that's that's the dilemma of most mental health problems: is the, the reason to be sick is immediate, and the reason to get better is delayed, and that's one of the. So um, the it's powerful the. You know the discomforts of exposure and response prevention, and and it takes energy and commitment. Um, so sometimes it doesn't. It, if somebody is struggling with that, there's a couple of possibilities. Sometimes it's time to go back to MI a little bit and take a pause and talk about 
maybe reestablishing their goals. Maybe they've reached the things that they initially wanted to reach, and maybe they need some new goals. Um, where do we go next? Um, and sometimes the decision is to take a break from therapy uh, and let the natural contingencies play out. Sometimes they establish new goals and we get back into it. But even then, there's the issue of how to day to day, how do I get myself to do stuff? And behavioral uh, models have wonderful um, ideas about and, and suggestions for uh, curating contingencies for people, self self motivation, um, self incentive, um, setting up incentives um, to um, uh, to get yourself. Uh, to, to do something, um, what, you know, that it, now with kids, you know, we're, we're all used to having reward systems for doing ERP behavior. We don't think about it as adults as often, but that, that, that we might set up in daily more immediate incentives for completing, completing homework. And, and there are some more draconian sort of interesting ways uh, that, and John, you probably <laughs> that I can see that evil look on you. Um, uh, that that you it, we usually would use positive reinforcement, uh, but there are other procedures. Um, I, I'm think I'm thinking three things. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds daunting. We have our. Um, I think um, being old, I've already forgot one of the three. Um, maybe it'll come back to me. No, I, I, you know, I actually if I have a motivated client, but who has difficulty, I will often make a deal with them where they give me their credit card. And uh, the deal is, if you don't do what we agreed to, we're going to donate to your like least favorite charity. <laughs> but but that's they're agreeing to it. That's not imposed on them. Um, you know, I, I do use this idea of scripts, things that people are going to listen to that are not only including the consequences of what might happen, but why are they doing it? So it's a kind of constant brainwashing thing of remembering, here's why I'm doing streaming. It's not just like, oh, the scary stuff might happen. It's like, and what am I going to lose if I don't do that? Then, and I'm not being facetious, I do have my secret motivator that my patients will tell you, oh, yeah, he does do this. Uh, in, in, in my entire years of doing it, it's only failed once. So if I'm with somebody and I'm trying to get them to do something and they don't do it, <laughs> I start playing this because no one in the world can resist Rocky. Now, I suspect that one of the reasons it works is they put it on infinite repeat until they break. <laughs> so there are patients who know as soon as they hear that, I think it's very inspiring and they also know there's no way out. So I, I, I suggest that every therapist has this in their repertoire. Um, <laughs> as I said, it's only, it, is only, it has failed me once. I was a little shocked. I, I thought, well, <laughs> well, you oh, just oh. inspired me, John. So Me I'm, too. I feel like I have to go do something. I don't exactly, know why. Exactly. Getting back into my boxing career, which was very yeah. sad. <laughs> Oh, hey, if you're doing that, let me tell you about my son later because, you know, this will, this will, you know, you can help his career. Go on. I was going to say quickly two things I know that helped in my own care is one, finding exposures that were built into real life stuff. So, for instance, like I had a really hard time eating at restaurants, but there was a breakfast burrito place near my house. And so making the exposure part of something I enjoyed. And then the next thing that really helped me is picking activities that I could start to do because of the payoffs from the ERP I've done that far. So there are certain activities I could couldn't do so it's almost like my reward because I agree with you Alec like you can't be giving like stickers and gummy bears in sessions with like a 47 year old adult I mean I guess you could but you know yeah. being able to say like hey you know you've wanted to travel and go down to San Diego for the weekend you've done enough ERP to get there go there there's probably gonna be exposures anyways but really reward yourself for the hard work you've done chocolate exposures are the best no no because we had a client we could there's a specific kind of exposure you know we had clients say to us Oh God, I wish I was afraid of chocolate, you know, because that seems better than putting my hand in a toilet. And there are exposures where it's like, oh yeah, you know, this isn't only overcoming fear. I actually want this thing. So yeah, when we can find those exposures, that's that's perfect, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, sometimes of course that's just a scare. You know, I've had clients, it's like, 
yeah, I want you to watch a movie in the middle of the day and waste time, you know, which, you know, I'd have no trouble with it for them. You know, it is terrifying, but it still seems better than hand in the toilet. <laughs> well, just, just to comment about the idiosyncrasies of the rewards you use. Um, I had uh, one patient, she was rather well to do. And um, uh, we decided that for every exposure she would do, we tried to figure out what really would motivate her. She created a, an exposure reward account in a bank, literally, she would transfer money into that account. Uh, based on each exposure, she'd get a payment that would allow her to go shopping. And I said, well, well, what would motivate you? Like how much money would you need to pay yourself per exposure? And she said, $500. Um, and <laughs> that didn't work with a lot of my patients for some way, reason. They, they said, no, I don't have $500. But she literally paid herself $500 each exposure and um, she got she got very much better and she also um, had uh, a lot of new clothes getting better and being stylish I, I mean what else can you <laughs> ask who for? could ask for anything more well that's really my motto in life in general um, yeah I do I do think this is an area of research the foundation should go into because you know yeah. except the clothes you know, come first then the well, well I don't know about the clothes but the five hundred dollars per exposure you know how many people would improve you know I wanted to jump into YouTube we have a question from Jay and I think it's really powerful at nine twenty three can you guys share maybe a success story where to families or to loved ones watching this where the person initially refused treatment but ended up getting better. Sure. Yeah. Um, somebody who uh, was had spent two years living in the corner of a house in a, in a public room on the floor in an area of about four feet by seven feet would not leave that area. Um, completely like life's fine. Refusing to do this. Tons of rules for the family of who was allowed to do there. They would eat a very limited diet and life was pretty restrictive. Um, and, and we had to approach treatment very differently because they initially had no interest. Uh, the family did quit. Well, I, you know, I tried for about two or three months and it was like, okay, this, this isn't going anywhere. So I started working with the family. Uh, there's a long period of time where I was clearly hated. Um, and uh, it, it, and this kind of treatment takes very long. So it took about three years. Um, but at the end of three years, this uh, was, you know, graduated college out in the world again, having friends and, you know, as opposed to being friendless in the corner, getting kind of homeschooled. So yeah, that can happen. I mean, that one was, you know, again, I think technically one where we think the odds are just so much against us because so many bad things are going wrong. So. I think um, the really wonderful thing about OCD, despite how devastating it can be, um, length of how long the persons have OCD and severity of OCD are luckily not the best predictors of outcome. So it doesn't mean you, you know, having having had it, it's like oh, and, and and I've had a number of patients because they've had terrible treatment you know, spent 30 years suffering. And then like within two years, their life is back. And, you know, um, you know, I think the thing is, it's, uh, it makes me look really good. But the truth is, I just did the right treatment, as opposed to, you know, I'm just really great. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, a lot of the comments in the, in, you know, are people wanting to hear success stories. So I think hearing that, you know, even if this is the one success story they hear, you know, somebody going from that position to where they are now after working with you, I mean, it really shows that people can get better and the treatment works. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would actually, I mean, I could give a number of examples of, of cases. It's just, um, and, and the stories are also different. We probably ought to write a book just on, on these different stories, you know, because of, um, uh, It'd be the positive book, yeah. It'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it would be. It'd be yeah. awful. Uh, tales of, uh, and it, you know, it, ones that particularly were treatment resistant. Um, and and then the, and I think what would be an interesting take on it is that family changes 
actually were part of that process. That that's what um, you know. It's not that I woke up one night and I decided I wanted treatment, but but how? What are the different ways? So when we when we did our first study on the family well-being interventions, um, we, we collected some data. Um, uh, we were disappointed when we helped the family stop accommodating without the without the identified patient in the in the room. But the good news was we were able to help people improve their lives and stop accommodating. And we we were hoping that most of the time that eventually will thrust the individual with OCD into treatment um, because they'd stop accommodating. And that actually did happen. Um, at least a third of the time, um, which is good. That's a 33% of people that might not have gone to treatment. Um, but it didn't always happen. But then if you looked at some of the other stories, if you just ask whether they went to treatment, that's different. But what did happen in many more cases was they started to engage in what I would call recovery seeking behavior as, a, as, a, as opposed to recovery avoidance. In other words, they had to take on things at home. Even if they didn't go to therapy, the conditions, the contingencies changed so that they had to, like, I had to start doing my own laundry uh, because my mom's not gonna do it anymore. Or, um, you know, those kinds of uh, sort of pressures that, that, so it's not just looking at, do they go to treatment, but there are, there are improvements in behavior that reducing family accommodations can create, even if the person never goes to treat. Thank you for pointing out family accommodation. We actually spoke to the guru of that, Barbara Vinopin, last week. So they can watch this episode and then watch Barbara's episode after about family accommodation. She's the guru, the queen of family accommodation, we call it. Yes, yes, she says hi to both of you. Um, I know you mentioned earlier, uh, John, and, and OCD Interrupted asked for at 924, uh, sorry, 925. Um, what is bad ERP therapy? I know we talked about it a little bit, but what are some things maybe if people, because I do think, you know, family members are taking their loved ones to a therapist that says they specialize in OCD along with, you know, everything else, tarot card reading, et cetera, et cetera, psychic uh, palm reading. How, how does one know that their loved one isn't getting better because they're getting bad at ERP? What are some of maybe the warning signs that you should be looking at. You know, it's interesting. I have so much to say about good ERP. And when you ask that question, it's like, wow, that would be a really long book. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, as everyone here knows, right? Average time from symptom onset to good treatment, 14 to 17 years. Yeah, it's very sad. You know, the very most obvious thing any family should ask, you know, what kind of therapy did they do? And the person has to say ERP. They can say CBT because even though ERP is a CBT treatment, if they're saying CBT, then I have no idea what kind of treatment they're doing. But, you know, everybody should know ERP for OCD is, is going to be the prime treatment. Um, I, I think we've actually kind of covered a bunch of the things here. So one is, uh, and, and I guess we could be talking about good ERP and superior ERP, treatment preparation, right? That is. Is the per have I convinced the person, first of all, are they willing to take the goal? I want to learn to live with uncertainty. If they don't want to live with uncertainty, then that's my therapy until I convince them to do that. You know, I think I can come up with really great arguments for that over time. But like I said, some people it takes a week. I've had people it takes three months. You yeah. know, why would they take this or so? Are they on board with the treatment? Which technically would be good advice for any therapy technique. And then it's how am I creating the ERP? You know, there there are ways that you know if, if I have somebody with a contamination problem, and the assignment today is touch this cup with this hand, that's bad ERP, because in that treatment I'm going to walk around like this all day, and I can fix it too easily. I need to pick something low enough that that person will touch everything in their environment and stick their hand in their mouth. You know, so in a way I'm I'm leveling up the environment. You know, so rather than start with a level three item, I start with level one, but nothing in the environment can be less than level one. So that kind of principle taken across whatever form we're taking, you know, I, I, you know, I have to do something that's pervasive because, you know, people will do whatever they practice most. So I have to have a treatment, as Alec noted, with homework. 
um, because I have to have something that's going to be pervasive. The reason contamination is the easiest is because I can screw up the entire environment in 10 minutes. And so now there's not a whole lot of choice about going back. Hit and run. You know, I can drive and we can kill lots of people today, but tomorrow's like a new day. So it's harder to make that pervasive. But, you know, so it's how am I going to make things pervasive and slowly level things up? And in making it pervasive and inescapable, you know, that's why preparation is so much because it's very scary for the person, right? We are asking something incredibly hard, but inescapable also helps bring about acceptance. It's like I've, I've got no choice. Hmm. So I could keep going, Ron. But but I think I think those would be, you know, some of the things I'm looking for and how it's instituted and how what is the patient told before they're doing it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so if you think about if you think about um, um, there's there's a more advanced, sophisticated analysis that we could all do of any individual case of ERP, and and all of us would be qualified to probably figure that out. But if we're talking about, uh, but I think you can you can spot bad ERP with a fairly superficial test. You know, it's sort of like whether you give the two questions for depression screening or you give the nine questions, I, the two hit most of the variants, right? Um, so, um, so okay, what did they call it? <laughs> did they include all three letters? E, R, and P? Okay, and was there homework? That's a simple one. Like any patient can answer that. Did he have you do things between sessions? Well, I don't think so. Then what did he have you do? I just And again, I'm not asking for fancy, just anything that sounds like it might be, right? And then it really the final thing is the RP, because the best example of, I th the most common example of a bad ERP is when it's E. <laughs> it's only one letter and um and in meaning that 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 the therapists who aren't trained specifically in ocd but like came from the anxiety field and learned about exposure are less critical they're less thinking about the response prevention part it doesn't matter how many things you touch even if you do it the way john wants you to if you go wash your hands and take a five-hour shower afterwards. It was all for naught. So, yeah. um, and and some anxiety people are trained in anxiety disorders, not necessarily OCD, are more tuned in. Although this shouldn't be the, because there's compulsions in every <laughs> anxiety disorder. But nonetheless, um, they're more likely to not be sensitive to the RP. Um, and so, when like, did you have rules for washing? Did you, did they teach you what to do instead of the thing you're supposed to be doing? They just tell you to stop doing something and they didn't help you figure out what you're supposed to be doing instead. Good I point. Would, oh. I would add one more thing. Alec actually might not agree, he might. <laughs> uh, I would also ask them, what was the goal of their treatment? Yeah. If they don't tell me the goal was to learn to live with uncertainty and we describe what does that mean? That would be the second question. But a lot of times they didn't do the first one. Um, then I'm thinking that was a major flaw in treatment. It also ends up being a major reason for hope because then I can say like, oh, OK, treatment didn't work. But I'm talking about something different. So that, that's often hope, but that, that would be another question for me that would be like, everything looked really nice, except that they, they, were trying to, they weren't trying to live in a real world. Well, I would, only, I would only disagree to this extent. I would mostly agree, but I would only disagree because I would accept a couple of other answers. If they said my, the goal of my therapy was to live with a feeling, not, a not right feeling, um, learn how to live with that, um, I would accept that. I'd accept that because in my little twisted mind, I'd be like trying to get a just right feeling is trying to be certain about a feeling. And you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would, yeah, I knew you knew that I would twist that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, and so, but I have to, but yeah, but you're, but we're accepting their own terminology about how they would say, I would say they're, they're on the right track. 
if they're in it. And there may be like 3%. Absolutely. I haven't figured it out yet uh, that of people that actually have a identified outcome uh, that might still be OCD. But in other words, that they, they, I, they, my goal was to learn that I don't stab my wife because I have a thought or something. Right. Okay, I'd go with that. Yeah. I'm going to try to see I, one I, I last question. Real, oh, sorry. I, 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 I had a support group last night, and we we're trying to pick goals for people to do. And a young woman who has uh, pedophile OCD thoughts, and she says she has this you know, ritual where she's around kids or something, she holds her breath. And she said, like, you know, I won't hold my breath. And I argued with her to, that that was no good because although she no because although she was going to not hold her breath, she simultaneously was wanting to have no pedophile thoughts when that was going to happen. So it's like, OK, there's no way that's happening. You know, that's a fail. You know, you're, you're going to try this once the thoughts are going to come in. and It's like this doesn't work. So it's like, no, no, we can't have a treatment where that is the goal. Uh, and then we had to talk a lot about treatment issues and what we were actually doing. <laughs> I'm going to sneak in one last question. So it's from Marcos V at 924. How do you deal with motivation if somebody's experiencing repeated setbacks? Because I think we didn't talk about that. And I think that's important. So let's say somebody's in treatment and they're not reaching their goals or having setbacks. Um, how do you, when working with a client, keep them motivated if they're having some of those setbacks? You know, I can always go, Alec, but I thought I'd let you go first for a change oh. just to be kind. Give me the hard question. Thank well, you. I thought I'd, I thought I'd practice uh, restraint, which, you know, is not characteristic. <laughs> well, um, so it it, um, it really depends a little bit on the nature of the setbacks and uh, what's going on. I mean, obviously, my first thing is I always want to find patterns in things because they're easier to deal with patterns than then thinking all these things are unconnected. That's that's going to make me feel um, hopeless and helpless. So um, if I can see a pattern in it, then I've I got a chance to break the pattern. So in other words, what's going on here in these setbacks? What what are there ways that we could actually prevent or curtail the setbacks? Um, and and very often there is. Um, so I, I want to see, I want to step back from it and not just focus on the setback, but see what happens between setbacks and what are we not addressing? We, um, now, we've all said setbacks are, are, are natural. They're, they're part of life. So we also want to decatastrophize them um, because they're actually part of, of um, the ongoing recovery. But, but it doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. So I, I would like to look at what's happening in between setbacks, are there things that we could do that that maybe would change that pattern? Everybody wants your book, by the way, of the positive story. So I saw a couple of comments that were like, there should be good stories about ERP, not always bad. So when you, when you write the book, please come back on. I would love to give you both uh, a second to say any final thoughts and also what's the best way for people to contact you. There's a lot of people in the comments that want to email you guys, work with you guys, et cetera, et cetera, see you as therapists. So what's the best way for them to contact you and any final thoughts to leave everybody watching with? We could start with you, John. Um, so contacting me, my website, laocdtreatment.com. Uh, and, and I think the most important thing is that what we do for treatment for OCD, uh, that if you're a sufferer, when you overcome OCD, you will not be normal. You will be better than normal. Because bottom line is most people don't handle uncertainty that well. I, I know Alec will agree with me on this. Uh, when, we, when the hit, pandemic hit, we found that our clients who had gone through treatment successfully did a whole lot better with the pandemic than their families. They could deal with this uncertainty. They said, my families are crazier than I ever was. Because that's, that's what normal people you know, do. So. Uh, it's kind of the consolation prize. You know, if you have OCD, you don't get to do regular normal. You get heaven or hell. We think since you've tried hell, heaven would be a good thing. But because these are good rules for everybody to lead, lead, live by, because I don't think anything is certain. And I think everything we do is a guess. Safety is always a probability statement, not a fact. Mm, very well said. 
I agree. And you're upsetting me because I don't like to accept that. But if you need to get in touch with me, I'm at laocdtreatment.com. <laughs> um, and, and, and actually, all of you write to me immediately at that address if you would. And have your relatives do that. <laughs> okay, no, all right. Uh, if people want to uh, get in touch, it's pollardA at slu.edu. You know that a bunch of people will not have heard that second part. <laughs> I'll, I'll forward them to you. <laughs> any, any final thought like, you'd like wait, to... wait, I thought I was getting the older looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> the handsome one. <laughs> <laughs> any final thought you want to leave everybody with, Alec? Um, yeah, that's kind of, that's probably the hardest question you've asked all hour. <laughs> like, I, you know, it's like asking a perfectionist, what is the, you know, um, no, I, I guess maybe something with the pandemic. Um, uh, one of the things that um, that the pandemic has done for me is kind of solidified, you know, my thoughts about how we cope through life. Like John was saying, there's there, there's no safety, but um, the there's there's really not much difference in process. With the pandemic versus before the pandemic, it's it's the specifics are, are different, but the idea of you cope with risk by following your own personal rules that you develop, uh, and those rules are sometimes inf informed by clergy, sometimes by science, sometimes by logic, sometimes by just what you want to do, but you develop rules to follow so that you can not be vigilant all the time about whether you're at risk and you follow those rules. So when the pandemic came, we had to adapt new rules. I didn't have to wear a mask. Used, used to be, I didn't have to wear a mask uh, unless I was going to a Halloween party, but otherwise I didn't wear it at a grocery store. But when I got less anxious and I was very anxious in the beginning, going out in the world in the pandemic, but when I became less anxious, it's not because I learned that I wouldn't get COVID. It was because I got comfortable with the co new context under which I was asked to function and accepted, John, you'll love this, the uncertainty. Um, and, and, that was, and, and uncertainty was part of the context within which I learned to feel safe. Um, but not by learning I wouldn't get COVID. And this is true for our OCD patients. We don't learn that these uh, proposed bad thing doesn't happen. Really, we never, uh, contamination has never really been about getting sick. It's been about either, John, uncertainty, distress, or not right, distress, disgust, which you could also weave into an uncertainty framework. And I would. Um, so, um, so it's about that, and that's what adapting to COVID has been as well. And so there's lessons about how do you recover from OCD. For those of us who don't have OCD, there's lessons about it. How did we recover from our pandemic anxiety? There's lessons for people uh, who don't have OCD to understand how you recover from OCD. Well, thank you both. Uh, both. I look up to both of you. So it was an honor to have both of you on the show and to everybody watching. I mean, you were really with two of the best uh, for this past hour. So I hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you everybody to watch. There was great conversation in the comments on all the different platforms on IOCDF. Based on the questions, you two, we could have gone another three hours. So maybe I know you're both busy, maybe down the road, I can sneak you back for part two because there were so many questions we didn't get to, but I really appreciate everybody watching your way. Uh, Chris's Corner happens. We get those questions and stuff. But thank you both so much for being here. It was really great information. I hope people really took a lot from it. Um, so thank you so, so much for both being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. It was great. Yes. Before we take off, quick announcement. Don't forget that the IOCDF is having their faith and mental health conference. That is May 21st from 1 to 5 Eastern time. You can sign up at iocdf.org backslash faith conference. And then if you want to know what is coming up on our live streams, just make sure you head over to iocdf.org slash peace of mind. You can learn more about uh, just Ethan's upcoming show. And then we are going to be launching anxiety and athletes live stream with a good friend, Tom Smalley. And then of course, just one final thank you uh, from Alec Pollard and for 
uh, John Grayson for being on the show. They were absolutely amazing. Thank you to everybody watching. And we'll see you back in two weeks for another episode of Chris's Corner. Thank you so much and take care. Go to iocdf.org for any more information. Thank you.